What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Game Dev Unchained, the number one game development podcast about game developers and the lifestyle thereof. I am your host, Brandon Pham, and with me, a special guest, William Deventhal. How are you doing, William? <laughs> Indeed. I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Thanks for having me, Brandon. Of course, man. Uh, before we get started, you know, this is the part of the podcast where I kind of ask you where you're from, where you're at, where you're heading to give a yeah. short introduction to the listeners and viewers out there. Awesome, yeah. Uh, my name is, yeah, Willem Delvinthal, um, or Delvin Tall. We were just joking about how there's a, uh, a fight in the family about which is the correct pronunciation. Um, I'm a game designer and game developer, been building games since I was 15 years old, a uh, really suitor, ultimately. Um, I am currently living in Georgia, but for the past couple of years, my partner and I have been traveling around the States, so we kinda, we've kind of been everywhere for the past few years. Awesome, man. So we got in touch through email, but you know, your, your your introduction was super compelling. Uh, you're doing a lot of great things for young developers out there. Yeah. Uh, how did you get started in the game industry? Uh, yeah. And how, you know, what drew you into it? Absolutely. I love that question. Um, it is a, so I feel like every person answers this the same way. They say, I played cool game. I decided must make game. Um, and that that's really ultimately the same answer for me as well. Um, my, uh, interestingly enough, both of my parents are uh, in theater, like theater, theater, not film. And they thought that they were among the generation that thought that video games were evil. So we were not allowed to have video games when I was young. But thankfully, I have two older brothers who broke them down. Um, my uh, middle brother actually bought a Super Nintendo that he then wrapped up and had his friend give to him on his birthday so that my parents would feel too guilty to take it away. And that's how we got our first video game console. Um, so I played all kinds of games. Chrono Trigger was the one that really like, uh, uh, just maybe absolutely love it as a medium and as a way for us to tell stories and engage and have fun. Um, and when I fell in love with games, I started playing around with making games. I used uh, Flash, Flash Action Script 2 and then 3, uh, Rip Flash, We Miss You. Um, and I sort of half accidentally sold a game to AddictedGames.com when I was 15 for a whopping $500. <laughs> um, but, you know, it was enough for me to go, oh, this is a career. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I started building games more seriously. And eventually when I graduated college, I worked at, uh, I got my first industry job at Lumosity. They're the brain training game people who I worked for, for uh, about four years. Great, man. Your path is definitely uh, very interesting and almost unconventional because, you know, as a game designer going through school, uh, I remember Flash. I, I do feel <laughs> like Game Maker was another tool back then. Too. Yeah. For, there was a, I felt like there was a lot of accessible game developer tools for game designers specifically mm. back then. Uh, if you even venture into the PC realm, specifically, you know, the modding tools of Counter Strike uh, and other, you know, you know, specifically Source Engine was yeah. a little bit more open. I think there is some return to that, but there has been kind of like a dead period for accessible tools. Now, I mean, we're talking about Unity Unreal. Yeah. I'm not dismissing those, but like it is more of a behemoth of accessibility tools. Yeah. Uh, and how do you feel, I'm asking you specifically, like the differences of the tools then versus now in mm. terms of somebody having an idea and, and wanting to see an end product mm. immediately? Yeah, interesting question. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I think I think as with as with anything, it's not necessarily better or worse. It's just different. I think we sort of um, what a lot of young game developers don't really understand is that uh, we're still in an incredibly young industry. Um, the giants that we all know and love, um, you know, the George Ramirez um, are, are still the Will Wrights. They're still alive and in like the prime of their careers. Yeah. Um, those people who invented game development are alive right now uh, and they're still making games. Um, so, so some people don't really understand how young we actually are. Um, I've been building games, you know, for like 15 years now. And even in that period of time, I've seen dramatic changes. And I, this is a great question because I would say that it was in a, in a sort of proto state um, 15 years ago, there were tools uh, modding. Absolutely. I kind of forgot um, modding halo uh, Halo Combat Evolved was one of the first, one of my first game development experiences. And I had so much fun doing that. Um, 
and then Flash got me into it. And then there were a couple of other little tools. There's there's one that nobody seems to know about called Sawblade Software that was Mac only, which was a terrible uh, product decision. Uh, but I made a bunch of platformer games in Sawblade Software. Um, now Nowadays, I think the big difference is that it is much better polished and much better corporatized, yeah. um, which is a blessing and a curse. It means that we have much more amazing tools. What Unity can do, what Unreal can do, what Godot can do is actually incredible. Um, But what you pointed out, which is that they are heavy, they're slow, they're sluggish, and they're really unapproachable is also totally true. Um, It's really hard for people to get started. Uh, But once you do, the power that's at your fingertips is unimaginable to Willem 15 years ago. Yeah, I I agree. I I mean, it's heavy, but there is like a, a smaller gap into as a hobbyist to actual game developer and studio conversion, right? Versus where before, yeah, you can publish something prototypey, uh, get it out there in front of people, which is fine, right? Mm-hmm. But the skills sometimes don't really translate to an in-game studio setting, right? Yeah. Um, you know, there are like, you know, just to be on the subject before moving on, you know, Unreal for Fortnite is, I think, mm-hmm. one of the biggest impact for accessibility from gamer to game developer that i've seen uh in recent years i mean there's a lot of like uh user generated uh content uh push right with roblox and and that whole space uh can you kind of talk about your views on that on 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 that kind of like space and how it is evolving gamers to Mm. game developers yeah that's interesting um i uh Let's see. For for the first time, I was looking at job postings, and for the first time, I saw a game developer that was exclusively Unreal for Fortnite. Um, wow, that must that be recent. Tri- <laughs> yeah, super recent. It's yeah. like a week ago or something, um, and that was a bit of a trip. Um, there was a uh, I went to GDC this year, which is something I highly recommend to anybody if you can if you can figure out how to afford it. It's unfortunately not super accessible. Um, but one of the GDC talks uh, was a, a dude who started a company building games in Roblox. And his company, I don't know exactly what they're worth, but sounded like they're making a couple million dollars a year, um, probably more than that even. Um, yeah. You know, maybe maybe ten million dollars a year. Um, so that's a pretty dang sizable company, yeah. and uh, they're building games inside of another game. Um, so I, I don't, you know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how I feel about it. I I think there's I've got two sides. Um, the side of me that wants to be more optimistic says like that's awesome. You know, we should be building things in platforms in games. Um, that we recognize and love. Um, you know, imagine like if Pokemon, uh, if Nintendo released like some sort of Pokemon SDK or something and you could like build Pokemon games and how amazing that would be and what incredible stories we would get from players and um, like what a, what, a, what a beautiful thing that would be. Like that side of me says, yes, absolutely. More accessibility, more ways to build games, more ways to play games, more ways to play games, yes. But the other side of me that is a little bit more nervous is basically the side of me that's a little bit more nervous about capitalism in general, yeah. which is that, you know, the bigger that places like Roblox become, the more authority they have, the more control they have, yeah. and, um, and the more they can box out the little guy. Yeah. Um, it's already really hard to make it as an indie developer, and the more places like Roblox take over more of the industry, um, the less pie there is for those smaller devs yeah there's definitely a uh, not fully realized uh model of what that means right i mean uh, early days there's games like minecraft there's games like uh, little big planet you know even mario yeah. has kind of like a, a mario maker right and it's more like a fun idea of like hey is your chance to play and, and be a game developer in, in a sort of indirect way right roblox was the first time i felt like they really monetized that model to yeah. a great degree and it is kind of weird I, I always try to explain to people especially in games mm-hmm. but also outside of games of that no the industry is really split in very different categories where there isn't really a lot of like overlay of people (laughs) understanding how each model works because this roblox to me is a a complete stranger uh in terms of what i know from the game industry 
right? And uh, I, I, there is no bridging the gap. <laughs> Even there's no like universal website that we can go to as a game developer that really explains like this is how the Roblox game developers do, uh, as opposed to like the mobile game developers and even an educational game developer. It's like we're still separate. And maybe at GDC, there is some kind of overlap. But even then, I feel like it's like if you're not <laughs> attending one conference, you have no idea. You, know, you, just, don't other, know. you, yeah. you just don't know. Right. And yeah. I don't see that really being fixed anytime soon. It's just like natural curiosity yeah. might make you venture into that that room. Right. But uh, I, I yeah, I do feel the fear that is underlying uh, all this with with you is that there might be a monopoly that yeah. is going to hit us by all surprises, right? Unre for, for Fortnite, I, I'm actually kind of surprised and didn't really think through that people are actually posting jobs for Unre for Fortnite. Yeah, what is uh, like mind blowing? What is it? Like, I never, I never even thought about that. Um, yeah. So, I, I mean, it's great Fortnite in a way. Like a yeah. idea, you know? <laughs> it's uh, yeah. I thought it was just like a little little uh, sandbox, yeah. right? For right. for you know. Uh, I want to label them as wannabe game developers, but like, right, yeah. <laughs> like I have no idea. Now, now they're like, if anything, they're like influencers. It's a, it's a weird, yeah. again, another extension of the game industry are influencers, right? Who play our games, who are bigger and get paid better than mm -hmm. us. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> then there is no real interaction. I do see some influencers like Dr. Disrespect and others are starting to team up or create their own game studios yeah. uh, to extend, you know, I'm sure they have great ideas. You know, we all started out as gamers. They, they extended that to a professional level, right? To an entertainment value level. And so they're, I'm interested to gonna see what their contribution is. And again, it's welcoming to kind of see the game industry growing, but it is a weird cannibalizing industry. You know, yeah. we, eat, we eat our own and it does yeah. kind of shut out for those who don't have the influence, uh, right? Uh, to to have the financing, you know, who are you gonna pick, right? right? Doctor's Disrespect or, or or this unknown indie developer that plays right. in his garage, right? Yeah. So there's a lot of questions and fear that I feel just as you as a game developer yeah. that uh, I don't know how this is going to turn out. Is it a net, you know, uh, net positive. benefit? Yeah, net yeah. positive or or not? Or not. I I think it's a it's a it's a good question and it's a sort of um, it's a difficult. I think it's an impossible question answer i think we just won't know until you know we get further i i until the, we're on the alarm, yeah until we're i mean hey chat gpt can make games now so we'll, we'll well, see it's all happening all at once yeah <laughs> it's all going. like our chances yeah and there's there's the like you know there's the dunes of the world the the uh uh mental bandwidth of us imagining the most horrible version of the future yeah. one of the consistent bad guys is basically just capitalism and I'm maybe being a little anti-capitalistic this uh this podcast but whatever i guess um you know there really are there's the versions of the future that are something like a dune where there's just a couple of corporations that own basically everything and and yeah. that version of the future is completely 100 percent possible yeah. <laughs> yeah um like there's nothing stopping it from happening and if anything i feel like we're even drifting that way um what i really want to see personally is uh you know a return to renaissance like i really want to see a uh a decentralized i know that's like a hot stupid buzzword but a decentralized game industry where more smaller studios are, are making are making enough money to survive and they don't need to be making a fortnight but you know enough money that they can pay their bills and, and eat some food. Um, because I think like undoubtedly the diversity of thought is what makes um, community interesting. Like it's, it's why Roblox actually is doing so well because they lean really hard into the diversity of thought of their creators. Um, they give them incredibly robust tools. Uh, you know, there are 13 year olds making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year right now because they made like a cool version of tag, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's something that I think is good. It, it's just a little unsettling to me that one person or one corporation owns so much of it. Yeah. 
It, there's definitely a, a division of camps that are happening, right? I mean, Microsoft is buying Activision Blizzard, right? They're trying to get that deal going. There's yeah. a Sony camp with their own first party and third party games. Uh, you know, Nintendo just making Nintendo games all the time. Epic on their own, right, is basically went through a controversy of gobbling up indie titles and making exclusive. Yep. Uh, Steam, I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> like, I, I feel like they're like <laughs> they're like releasing Slowly some Half Life games. Or they, yeah. I think they're, they're starting to like do some creative stuff, right? Releasing yeah. like Counter Strike Two out of nowhere, right? Once in a while, yeah. uh, but there's definitely a uh, you know there was an indie re uh, renaissance, you know, with Steam Greenlight. You know, there was a yeah. period of Super Meat Boys and all these uh, fantastic games coming yeah. from you know two guys in a garage, uh, and and it, it birthed amazing thing even. During the pandemic, there was a couple of standout games that really uh, created a community during basically a very lonely time, right? For others, like Fall Fall Guys, right? Mm -hmm. But even as soon as something got, got big, Fall Guys got bought by Epic, you know, like 10 minutes later. And it was made in Unity, which is like an insane, like, what? How does this go? <laughs> like, you know, and uh, it, it doesn't seem like it's possible as much, even though the tools... Yeah. right are so available from idea to publishing right mm -hmm. it feels like for marketability and actually sell through that yeah. you have to sign up to a camp now to yeah. for success right yeah. um i'm seeing less and less of what the indie days were right. uh and uh, yeah i you know at, at some point you're gonna have to i think maybe half and half right no, nothing's black and white Mm -hmm. But there needs to probably be some sacrifice of unique individual vision, right? To kind of align with corporate, you know, um, need. need, right? Yeah, I think um, there's a so there's a term that I use sometimes that I wholeheartedly believe in, which I call tactical optimism. Basically, um, I think a team is more likely to succeed. And I think um, like a society is more likely to succeed if, if we're optimistic. Um, a, if uh, I think we've all experienced this, we've had like a friend who's super negative and like, man, it just kind of sucks to hang out with them. Yeah, yeah. Um, the uh, so so that in that in that lens, um, I think, you know, one way or another, there's more money being made in games and there are more people who are self-employed or just employed in general in games than there have ever been. So I say that because I don't want any listeners to be like, damn, yeah, games are just, ah, oh, the good days are gone and we're screwed. <sighs> That's definitely not true. And, and in addition to that, I want really what I want to see is a call to action. Um, I want to see more people working together to build really cool stuff and supporting those smaller indie devs. Um, so you right now can make a difference person listening right now. Um, you know, next time you buy a game, maybe spend that money on like literally five or six indie titles. Cause they tend to be so much cheaper too, instead of that one new call of duty or whatever the heck just came mm -hmm. out. Uh, I think people, understand right the value of indie and individual voices and uniqueness yeah. but i don't think they see really the impact of how yeah. these games really change the paradigm of the trends right? right i mean warzone 2 is huge right now right but they forget that it came from even before PUBG, right yeah. from uh what was that game day of um uh, uh i don't remember the first it was yeah. a mod of Arma 3 and then yeah and there was minecraft mods that's where i first ran into it there were there were minecraft mods that were basically hunger games based yes. on the hunger games franchise and that was where i went whoa this is a really cool formula and then PUBG came out a couple months after that yeah and then fall guys came out and it, it yeah. promote more like a you know a, a friendly competition type of yeah. obstacle course thing and, and that kind of killed i mean awkward walker that's what i've started calling those <laughs> yeah but so if you look at like the major trends that was the sameness right with triple a right. especially uh yeah. like rocket league all these games came from smaller teams because they can yeah. move fast they can innovate right and they really yeah. to stand out they have to be that they gotta way. do something new yeah and the the fear is that because because of these corporate umbrellas that that are forming yeah. that this the sameness eras will last a little longer 
Yep. Uh, and these gains are really taking five to ten years versus yep. you know three to five years on average, right? right for for bigger games. Mm-hmm. Um, even Among Us, you know, Among Us was a game that hit it big and was mainly three developers. It was mm-hmm. huge along with Fall Guys. Yeah. Epic got kind of in trouble because they tried to incorporate some of that in Fortnite and immediately yeah. got called out on it. Uh, great. Luckily, they backed off. So Among Us yeah. is still living, but it kind of gave birth to a lot of betrayal games. Yeah. You know, in, in the period afterwards. But like if yeah. you talk about all these games that really got everybody talking about it in a viral way, uh, it, it's always been smaller teams. Like, yeah. you know, and the, the, the big teams just keep milking the same formula until someone gets bored of it. And then they just throw something new in the mix. Well, it's, it's interesting. The, um, so, uh, once again, I was at JDC recently and in three different talks that I went to, somebody mentioned creating a good game is 90% copying somebody and 10% innovation. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, as a game designer, as a younger game designer rebelled against that. I was like, no, I'm going to invent something totally new. Mm-hmm. But as I get more experienced, I realized that that's, that is true. Um, we, for the most part, don't want something brand new, um, because it just doesn't feel good. Imagine how many times you've scrolled through your zoom library and looked at that one game that you bought and then never played because you don't want to learn how to play it. Um, for the most part, we do want things that are familiar that, that, uh, harken back to those nostalgic days of games that we used to love and then have a twist and then twist it a little bit, um, give us something slightly new. Um, the, the ecosystem of AAA, which is the big if anybody doesn't know what that means and the big companies versus an indie, which is small, like usually zero to 12 people. Um, the ecosystem of those two is a really interesting sort of yin yang. Um, triple A's would absolutely collapse without indies. Yeah. Um, because they, you're right. The innovation comes from, um, indies almost 100% of the time they come up with new formulas, a recent one that just came out the, the now what we're calling survivor like genre. Um, so vampire survivors, you're familiar with that. Mm-hmm. Can you explain that more? Are you talking yes. about the la- the last game from Arcane? No, or, or uh, no, else? Vampire Survivors. It's a it's a two D uh, like um, it's, it's sort of eight bit. It looks like Castlevania style art. Okay, old school okay. SNES Castlevania. Yeah. And basically, all you do is walk around, and you have a character who auto fights. So oh, uh, and you have hordes and hordes of enemies. That's one of the core pillars of the game design uh, of the genre. So you've got hundreds of enemies coming after you, and ultimately all you do is walk around and your dude like automatically whips at them um but you get upgrades and now your dude's whipping with fire and then you get oh yes i saw a bunch of games like this i saw a zombie version of this as well yeah 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 so this is now a new genre and Mm -hmm. um uh, vampire survivors it was not the first but they were the first ones to popularize it and it was literally one dude who's now made well over i think five million dollars last time i checked um from a game that he built in a couple of months and now there are other bigger companies that are creating survivor likes right. um because they know that it works so so that ecosystem um of of indies uh like if we're talking about like a coral reef the indies yeah are the coral. They're the bedrock that all the other life can even sustain itself off of. Yeah. So if Indies ever get starved out, triple A's become the same thing over and over again because they're too scared to innovate and because yeah. they're too bureaucratic, they're too big to um, really be able to even push innovation. The minute somebody says, let's innovate, somebody else says, well, in my product experience, innovation doesn't work. Um, and that's because they're pretty much right because Indies are willing to fail a bunch of times until they get that one golden nugget. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is kind of, it it bleeds true for even the tech industry. I mean, basically every company, right? I mean, we're seeing with the tech industry, Facebook, Google, yada, yada, are laying out thousands of people pretty much, you know, figuring out they haven't done anything (laughs) to to innovate. I mean, the reason why ChatGPT, again, another huge, like, next wave of the internet upgrade, right? Yeah. Came from a small company. Uh, and mm-hmm. Google and, and and Microsoft, smartly enough, bought into that. But Google, everybody else is kind of following and, and basically years behind, yep. right? And and this is just true for anything, basically. Yeah, um, it's the David versus Goliath. It's a yes. it's an ingrained message that uh, an ingrained story that is true just for humanity. Yes, yes, and, and it's uh, what I fear is you know. There's obviously AI is like the biggest talk this year, right? It's interesting to kind of see how how innovative OpenAI is going to remain, which Ooh. is probably 
<laughs> you know, already <laughs> diminishing returns at this point because they're owned yeah. by basically Microsoft. Um, but I, I kind of want to get back to you. Uh, you know, you have obviously this aspiration to to yeah. inspire young developers, right? Yeah. Um, you know, can you talk more uh, at length? You know, you, you started maybe with Luminosity. I remember that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's one of the few, I think one of the b impacts as a younger gamer that I don't think a lot of people draw back to is, of course, we got the Marios, but it's a very niche, mm -hmm. you know, nerdy group of kids at that point that understands and know what that is, right? Mm -hmm. But like, it was like the educational games in the classrooms, like Oregon Trail for me, that yeah. I was able, and, and even the, like the math games that made educational stuff interesting that like math blasters yeah oh, so it took <laughs> it took a good portion of my uh gamer life uh yeah. to to kind of eventually boost me up to game developer can you talk more about that space how did you get into it and yeah you know what the evolution you're seeing now uh, uh gamifying things for yeah education? definitely yeah absolutely i um it's, it's a i never really intended to enter this space um i think in large part i'm here because that first industry job was at lumosity which was specifically brain training games um so if if you're unfamiliar with lumosity they were super big you know one of the one of the companies that everyone's talking about maybe like eight years ago now and they essentially had a scare with the ftc that uh really killed their momentum um but uh yeah wh while i was there i started on an internal startup called Lumi kids where we were building educational content for two to six year olds and it, i think it just like it just created an <laughs> like an addiction or something for me as a designer um because those moments where i created uh you know we had really challenging prompts at lumosity that i also found super fascinating that were different from any other design framework or any other design challenge it wasn't how do we get somebody to you know stick to their day seven retention better it was instead like how do we teach working memory to a two-year-old that doesn't know how to read and i just i just found that super fascinating um, you know, trying to communicate non-verbally, trying to create uh, game design challenges that intuitively taught you something instead of having to tell you it. Um, and now, uh, so I haven't really mentioned this, I guess. Um, after Lumosity, I uh, started a couple of companies. Um, and the one that actually wound up sticking is the one that I'm working at now called the Indie Game Academy. So we are uh, exclusively, ex uh, explicitly a gamified online school for game developers. Um, so our students get formed into multidisciplinary teams that then build a game together and publish that game together under the guidance of seven industry professionals over three months. Um, and we do all kinds of things to make it just fun. And it's it's such a simple premise, but it works so well. Um, we, for instance, teach classes in a virtual online castle. So our students walk around an actual little castle and, you know, go find the classroom in the little castle. Mm -hmm. um, or we have the coveted house cup. <laughs> um, they get sorted into four magical houses, the uh, warriors, uh, the rogues, the rangers, and the clerics. And those houses compete in a friendly way um, to try to win the house cup each cohort. Um, um, and, and it's a lot of these really small, tiny tweaks that wind up giving it this uh, holistic vibe that just makes it more fun. And then metrically, like by our numbers, also works better. Um, we have lower dropout rate than pretty much any of our competitors. We have higher conversion rate than pretty much any of our competitors. And it's because we just have fun. Um, and because we also have created a really wonderful, supportive culture. Um, so there's a lot of stuff happening in this space. We've sort of known for a long time that gamifying education works. Um, there's a lot of authors out there. Um, I mentioned Yu Kai Chow. He's one of the ones I really like. Um, I also like Amy Jo Kim. She talked about uh, gamifying business, but still super valuable and interesting. Um, Jesse Shell is one of the like old school names. He's just about game design in general, but he talks about applying game design to all kinds of different things. Um, and I think one of the reasons that it hasn't actually innovated very far, because um, the term gamification was super hot, like. I don't know, 15 years ago now, um, and now is almost like a bad word. Um, the reason it is sort of stagnated is because I think basically real game designers stopped doing it. Mm. Um, 
So like an educator says, I'm going to gamify my classroom and they can only understand a surface level of the, of, of game design. And they say, okay, I'm going to stick some, some points on this and then our students will love it. Um, and honestly, you'll get a lot out of doing just that, <laughs> like just points. Um, but there's so much more to game design as any game designer knows than a, a reward mechanism. Um, and, uh, and, and pretty much anything that you've learned in design, you know, focusing on your design pillars, emotional deliverables, trying to create a core loop that's engaging and enticing on its own. All of those things apply to pretty much everything. It's just design. Um, and design works cross department, cross discipline, cross industry. Um, so, you know, I have like specific insights we've learned at the Indie Game Academy, but I think really the biggest one that I want to convey to any of you designers out there is what you do. Um, uh, what, what you are essentially studying is human motivation. You're essentially figuring out how to get somebody motivated to play a game. Because unlike any other product out there, you don't have to play a game. You can stop at any time. You know, I don't need, I need to use my crutches. Otherwise, I can't walk. I don't need to play video games. Um, so that, that like, that it's really powerful. That, um, that simple mindset, take game design, apply it to other stuff, get people excited about it. Yeah, I think uh, inspiring younger students, I think, is at an all time low right now. <laughs> uh, there's so many uh, factors to it, right? I mean, we talk about Gen Z generation, there, you know, the YouTube phenomena of like quick money, right? Attitude. Mm -hmm. There's also this onslaught of AI tools, yeah. you know, with uh, ChatGPT just giving me the answer because I don't want to think, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and I, I even suggested in a couple of podcasts ago to my guests saying that like college campuses, educational system need to hit a pause button because the way it's structured right now doesn't really, uh, uh, cover the why, <laughs> well, it doesn't work, yeah. but it doesn't cover the reason why. <laughs> A student right. shouldn't just use chat for the, for the answer. There's no motivation. Right, there's no, yeah, it's like yeah. Just the, 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 the line of thinking, critical thinking is just unnecessary to a lot. Well, of I put in this effort when I can just yeah. Google it. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Because, yeah. you know, you're talking to a generation where I want to buy now. Right. Mm -hmm. I want things now. Right. Without putting in the hard work. Hard work is a very, they, they are associating that with our age group now where it's like, it's not necessary and yeah. it doesn't equal happiness, right? Yeah. Like the grind is like a almost slavish term of like old thinking to yeah. a lot of younger students or younger people, right? Um, I don't think... If I can interject for a second, yeah. I, don't, yeah. I don't think they're wrong. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. You know, I think you, you bring up a great point and I think that's a really fascinating line of thought that the like education is missing the why, why do I need to put in the grind? Why do I need to focus? And I think part of the answer to that question is that it is unnecessary. Um, you know, the amount that we work in our society in today's, uh, with today's automation, um, is exactly as much as we all agree to. Yeah. Um, you know, we could, that's not quite true. You know, we couldn't all work zero and still survive and function, but we could work half as much as we do now easily and still all survive and have ample. Yeah. Um, but we've, we've sort of bought into this system of, well, if you just grind harder, you get amazing riches and rewards. It's, it's yeah. the American dream being propagandized into our generation and, and older. And the new generation is like, I'm not getting rewarded for that work. So why am I doing this? This is pointless. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I guess really the, the only thing that I wanted to interject is like, I don't think they're wrong. Honestly, yeah. I, I think we're way overworked and I think we're way under rewarded. And I think wealth is way over, um, uh, centralized. There are yeah. far too few people with far too much money. <laughs> yeah. There's definitely a lot of questions that have popped up in discussions. Uh, I, I feel like aren't fully explored yet because we're coming off of pandemic. Everybody was at home. I mean, there was a crisis of people job hunting and jumping ship, right? Uh, remote working became a thing. Why show up to the office when I can save up the commute time, right? Yeah. There are definitely aftermath, but because of all these like uh, <laughs> things happening all at once, people kind of made like really quick decisions. And I think a lot of our friends are kind of suffering from it too. Where it's like, yo, I don't like this new place with these people. <laughs> I kind of miss my old job because now everyone's kind of being forced back to in the office. It's like, 
in, in, in a very indirect way. It's like, hey, if you're not back in the office next week, you're, you're fired, right? And all these job cuts are happening. Like, I think there was a lot of valid concern of like the system in place, right? Um, but, you know, I, I always feel like there's, you know, one extreme to another extreme is never like the, the answer, right? Yeah. Uh, and I would even say like, the, there is like a spirit of the competitiveness of people who are willing to go in the office kind of beating the one who are remote because now they're accessible to the bosses you know who are you going to fire when you got to lay someone off so there's so many questions and unanswers that are still happening i feel in in the workplace uh for all industries but especially for games right that uh I don't know, man. Who who's thinking about this? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? We don't yeah. have like you know a website. It's like, all right, who's actually looking into this and giving us the answer? We're all figuring it out. And yeah. the game industry, of anything, everybody's kind of we we're in teens, but everyone's been out on their own since I think the inception of games. It's like we were fighting through crunch culture and all this. Uh, I mean, it was only a few years ago, yeah, that we were unionizing, which nobody ever thought would ever happen, right? Yeah. But we're starting to see more and more companies like unionizing. Um, there's a lot of crazy things since the pandemic that were reacting. Yeah. I, I would say more fallout, right? Mm -hmm. um, than than like uh, there's actual crazy growth. But maybe there's just these years, these years of time to kind of reap from the savaging <laughs> that we're going through right now so it's just gotta wait a little longer to kind of find things out um but i, I want to hear your thoughts about that it's like it's so much shit from the pandemic working remote uh, uh all these discoveries people jumping questioning the system but not really having another system to really fully get behind but just trying everyone's trying to do their own thing and hoping that we hit the target somehow and be okay, you know, unscathed. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. So much, so much, so much pain. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, I like know. to, uh, let's, let's gear it to young developers then. All right. Just all to, right, uh, right. to that demographics, like what yeah. are they supposed to do? I mean, they're coming they out of school, right, right? With all these skills that AI is kind of like, yo, we don't need junior positions for this anymore. Remote, especially, are kind of staying away from young developers because they need that kind of independence experience to self-govern at home, right? Um, and they're missing the mentorship from being in the office from older developers to kind of show them the ropes. That's where I learned most of my skills and upgraded. But that younger generation, you know, the rare opportunities they're having right now, they're not even seeing that, you know, the yeah. benefit of, of being around older developers. Right. Yeah. yeah, I, boy, it is a, it is a tough question. And honestly, <laughs> chat GPT, like alone, not, none yeah. of the other things you've been talking about alone makes anything that I'm about to say to you sort of obsolete because who knows? <laughs> yeah, who knows? Um, yeah. But, um, you know, we've definitely discovered a couple of things at the Indie Game Academy and, and I've noticed a couple of things. Um, I have a personal goal of helping 10,000 people make games. I don't mm -hmm. know, it just sounded cool. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've crossed about 1,500 now. So oh, I've, wow. I've worked yes. with a good number of people. Yeah, and, and I've started to see some trends. So there's a couple immediate things that I can say that I know will help you, hands down. And, and I think that's sort of the most important thing. The number one rule, and this has become sort of a meme at our academy because people will ask me questions and I'll answer it with this all the time. Okay. The number one rule, the number one tip is just make games. Mm -hmm. um, it, I, you know, I don't know if that's a disappointingly simple answer, but like it, it's true. Um, you should be making games. You should be making games with teams. You should be making games with multidisciplinary teams and you'd be making games with people who are more experienced than you are um, as best you can. So go find somebody who you think is really cool and say, hey, I'm looking for experience. You know, are you willing to hop on a team with me? Maybe do a game jam with me. If you don't know what game jams are, oh boy, go look up game jams, uh, h.io slash jams or Ludum Dare are both amazing. Um, and just build some games. Um, a lot of what you just talked about losing from the physical workplace uh, are filled in by um, by just building games with with a team explicitly exclusively. Um, now, I uh, I think the the reality of the future is um, people need to be more self driven. Yeah. Are going to need to be and already are. Um, there is no longer 
I mean, a lot of people are still getting in-person jobs and I recommend them for exactly what you're talking about. I actually went full-time remote like three years before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And now I am so sick of it. And I just want a job at an office (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, because there really is a lot that gets lost um, in fully remote environments a lot. You know, Mm -hmm. there's the saying that like 80% of communication is body language. And if all we have is a video screen, we're not getting that. Um, So I, I think, uh, you know, you really just need to be self-driven and, and it, and it unfortunately requires some of that grind. Um, I don't know what social mechanism we're going to fall into or what is the right one. I think we're all agreeing on some points. We're all agreeing that uh, pay should be more equitable. We're all agreeing that we should have to work less. We're all agreeing that there should be certain things socialized, such as education and healthcare. Um, but we don't know exactly how to just make that all happen. And I don't think we can guarantee that it's going to happen. So, you know, the um, part of sort of uh, part of the approach I think you need to have or the mental mindset is that. Yes, there's things that I want to change about the world and I want to change about the world. Um, And don't forget those and act towards them as you can. But ultimately, you're in a game right now with certain rules. Um, And those rules reward grind and they reward ass kissing and they reward networking. Um, And so play that game and enjoy the game as best you can Mm -hmm. Um, and and make games. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's definitely a pre-COVID and post-COVID uh, for for networking, right? I mean, mm-hmm. maybe there are some uh, cross pollination that that still exists. Uh, can you can uh, go through over some points that you notice, like the differences that is more available, less available now than before mm-hmm. for all developers, especially young developers? Yeah, interesting question. Um, there's a couple things. So number one. We don't have offices as much anymore, um, which is one of your key places. Um, I don't know any actual stats, but I'm willing to bet, you know, most relationships start in office um, or at least most adult relationships. I'm willing to bet most like uh, romantic relationships start in office. I'm willing to bet most mentor relationships start in office. Um, So we don't have that anymore, or at least not many people do or less people do. Um, But that said, something interesting has happened. So. First of all, there's a lot of opportunity with online networking Um, and you can get a pretty good amount out of online networking, actually. Um, And a lot of people are know this problem. And so they're trying to figure out how to make it better. Um, I actually think I don't know what they changed. I actually think GDC's attempt at that this year really sucked. Mm -hmm. Um, But in previous years, I've met really important people to me uh, just through like GDC's networking tab. what, can you explain what they did this year that was so different for those they who switched, didn't go? Yeah. So in previous years, they had uh, like a, a portal where you could reach out to people and say like, hey, you know, I'm Willem. Um, can I come on your cool podcast, uh, Brandon? No. Um, and then you would talk about it. Um, this year they had they used a new service. And it was essentially the same. But I got quite literally zero responses from mm. anybody. Mm-hmm. Um so maybe it's me, <laughs> um, but it but it sure seemed like there it was just sort of crickets by comparison. Uh, but regardless, um, there are people who are trying to make online networking work. Um, and what I would recommend you do is you go to online first um, networking events, meaning you don't trust GDC to do online networking because what they know how to do is in person stuff. You instead find those organizations that are online only because um, they they just know how to make it better. Um, you know, IGA's events, we've focused so hard on making it feel like there's other people in the room and getting connected to them, etc. Um, so online online networking is way more effective than you might think. Just Google online events, go to like meetup.com. That's great. Uh, there are there's a website that I don't quite remember that's like a big old list of um online only game conventions. Uh, Maybe just search that online only game conventions. Um, But then the other thing that I want to call out here is that because there's been a loss of uh, people like going to things because that has um, tailed off so much, I've actually found that it is more effective to go to things. Um, I think everybody's craving it at least right this second. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, 
people are really hungry to meet you in person and talk yes. to you and hear your story. Um, so I actually think that interestingly enough, my advice is to find anywhere and everywhere. Meetup.com is a great place. Many different conventions are great um, to meet people in person because they really want to right now. Yeah. Um, you know, they're sick of people reaching out uh, over email or whatever. Um and then I guess one last tip I'll give you is don't be scared to cold call as well, which means reach out to people you don't know. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of our professors, the, the coolest people we work with, we have like uh, Victor Blanc, who's an art director on Minecraft Dungeons, uh, who teaches uh, visual design for us. Like he was literally just me messaging somebody on LinkedIn. Um, and I messaged like 100 people and got like two of them to come to get back to me. So don't be scared to just put in a little grunt work too and reach out to strangers. Yeah, we're we're in a weird time right now for sure. Like I think uh people are discovering that being in physical space with someone to network is actually pretty it's cool. Like, nice, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like it's it's a uh, it, it's weird because I, I want to smell the sweat, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but the, you, like you said, there, I don't think yeah. there's ever going to be a real replacement, yeah. especially for game designers such as yours. Yeah. Just plain exactly, you guys talk all the time, right? Yeah. To a brainstorm, it, there hasn't really been all these great tools are happening, but like nothing replaces. Yeah the person the person interaction of just like feeling closer and closer yeah feeling yeah. each other's energy i i equate it to almost stand up right like trying to <laughs> listen to stand up through a zoom call which they try to do is not the same as being in the actual room I'm just gonna and, scroll through reddit and, anyway and see, yeah seeing yeah. the performance right so like, i think with the brainstorming creativity uh, to foster even more yeah. creative ideas, you kind of feed off each other's energy. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, all disciplines benefit from that, but game developers, uh, game designers in particular, I feel yeah. like I don't think there's a replacement for that. Um, I heard this concept and I, it's it kind of ties into this, like, I think basic idea that I feel about, particularly about game designers. I really feel like you guys are like going to be the architect of the future, right? I mean, that's how the Matrix was created, right? I'll the take Matrix, that. I'll take that. The Matrix <laughs> is a game, <laughs> yeah, ma metaverse, right? Yeah. Uh, that 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 you know uh, the, the you know Chat GPT created, right? But like, <laughs> we're not far from that, which is like it's, real it's scary. <laughs> but I heard this concept of people calling basically the internet as the third place, right? They, they equate your home being the first place, your uh, workplace being the second place, and how people congregate is the third place, which is the internet now. So yeah. there definitely the, 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 the gap between the workplace, home, and third place is kind of converging because everyone's kind of doing it one place now. Yeah. And it's creating like a huge paradigm shift, right? But also a lot of confusion of uh ownership but also individuality you know uh if anything these social spaces is becoming anti-social uh in a lot of ways people feel more separated and isolated than ever right um i would like to kind of hear your 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 you know maybe this is the first time hurting hearing about that but as a game designer yeah. i feel like this kind of ties into a lot of how you guys think like what yeah. what, what are your feelings about this description of what people are kind of generalizing this generation? Yeah. Uh, great question. I don't know if I have, um, you know, we tend to fall back on answers we've come up with before that sound good. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if I have one for this. I think, uh, I think, I think it's, I think it's undoubtedly true that the internet has become an ingrained part of our lives. I love, I've, I haven't heard of that um, description as the internet is the third place. I, I love that as a description, not necessarily because I think it's how it should be, but I think it undoubtedly is how it is. Yeah. Um, I think uh, it's so for at the Indie Game Academy, for instance, we, we really do, you know, we have spent years now iterating how to make our, um, classes just compelling, interesting, yeah. fun. Um, we use a service called gather.town. If anyone uh, doesn't know what that is, it's basically zoom, but worse, uh, <laughs> you have little characters who can walk around and when you're close enough to each other, a little 2d, like eight bit characters, when you're close enough to each other, you can see each other's, um, faces like it's zoom. So you can see actual cameras. Um, and it's like, it, it's, uh, uh, it has been incredibly, um, it's been amazing to me, uh, surprising, I guess, how much of a difference that made. Cause we started by teaching just on zoom, like everybody else. Um, 
And just having an actual space, a little virtual castle with little virtual common rooms that you can walk around in that literally makes the experience worse as far as a UX perspective comes from. Like people get stuck in corners and their internet connection is bad and they can't move their avatar where they need to move them. Um, But just having that physical space with a physical character, even though it's virtual, um, I think just allows memories to form more strongly and allows connections to form more strongly. Mm -hmm. Um, Now that's what we're doing as, as far as, you know, everybody else and approximating this in person. I think I've thought before about books in general, Mm -hmm. um, how I, I, I sort of suspect that books will never go out of style. We'll always have books and we'll always have printed books as long as we have trees, I guess, or something to print them on. (laughs) Um, and, uh, and I've thought about this from, from a design perspective and why is it that we want printed books, despite the fact that it's way more efficient to like, listen to them on tape or have a Kindle or something like that. Like why didn't Kindle kill books? Cause it didn't, it definitely changed how we think of books. Um, but it's because of that, like kinetic, like maybe genetic memory mm-hmm. of having something physically and having something in the real world. And I think like, no matter how close you get to approximating, if we have, if we had a perfect simulation, like literally I can smell you, I can see your entire body down to the poor, a perfect simulation. I would argue, or I would guess that that still won't be a replacement for real life mm-hmm. because literally if nothing else, knowing that it's not real doesn't make it as effective. doesn't make it as enjoyable. doesn't make it as a connective. So I think we're in a really interesting place where we are rapidly accelerating our tech, but for the first time as a species, we're like, maybe we don't need to do that or don't yeah. want to do that. Um, and I think we will keep rapidly creating tech because, you know, money and stuff. Uh, but I think ultimately we're, I think we're kind of bouncing back right now in a way that I actually think is really healthy. Um, we're going, you know, it was nice to be remote for a while. It was nice to be away from people and on my own. And I, maybe I want some of that in my life, but ultimately that, that real human connection, the IRL is, is just too important to ever let go of, I think. Yeah. Uh, I I think, uh, you're, you're right. Like not everyone is fully buying in to this like internet only, um, everyone's like the corporate, you know, the government, everybody's kind of pushing towards this, like, Hey, digital only format. Right. Uh, but even the boss of, you know, of these huge tech companies are like, no, let's get back in here. You know, we're seeing our profits going down, you know, uh, for, for whatever reason, it's not, you know, we're not doing as well as we thought we would, uh, because there's some pushback, um, from all fronts, right. Not just employers, but employees as well. Uh, I do want to talk about this, you know, in, in our emails back and forth, you were yeah. mentioning, you know, friendship first metaverse. I mean, yeah. the metaverse was one of those terminology, like many other things that kind of really boomed during the pandemic. Right. Yep. Um, I think, honestly, I still think Fortnite is at the forefront. They're doing things <laughs> like they own every pretty, pretty much every license right now as a character Uh they're the closest they're actually a game company they're gonna find the most success out of it but uh as a game developer as a game designer like what what are your thoughts about this space Mm -hmm. that feels like everyone's buying in but we haven't really see any huge advancement really right as we yeah <laughs> waiting for ready player one it's like isn't this an mmo right. it's like how come we can't yeah. recreate mmo <laughs> it's like what's going exactly, on exactly though <laughs> yeah 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 i think you know i think metaverse is such a hilarious term because yeah. we've had air quotes metaverses since like the 60s yeah. you know we had text-based multiplayer games i don't know if people know that we had text-based mmos yeah. We had, we had, uh, uh, you know, you could type, I head to the North and it says, now you're in a library and it's text only. It says mm-hmm. now you're in a library and in here is air dog 55, you know, mm-hmm. like we, we had that, we had that for years and that's a metaverse. Um, I think it's sort of, you know, there's people are aiming for a grander ideal of that. I think the the interoperability, the inter connectivity where you can travel from one metaverse to the other, I think is a big part that's missing. And that's supposedly the difference between a metaverse and just an MMO. But ultimately we've had the entire core design principles of metaverses already ironed out via massively multiplayer online games. Yeah. Um, 
the only difference is we're trying to use them for other stuff. We're, we're trying to gamify now. Yeah. Um, so that friendship first metaverse that was, uh, I was working for a company called together labs. They are most famous for making Imview, IMVU. Mm-hmm. Um, they were actually interestingly, one of the first people doing a metaverse. Um, Imview is ancient now by technology standards. Um, and it w- essentially was just an avatar based chat room. Um, mm-hmm. so you could, you know, sit in a room with your cool, sexy lady dressed up in cool outfits and talk to each other. Mm-hmm. Um, and they took a shot at, uh, at making what they called a friendship first metaverse. Uh, it was a product called with me. Unfortunately, they shut it down, uh, during all these layoffs. Um, but the core principle was, can we create, you know, we, we've all heard, we've all seen the crazy toxicity that we experience online. So can we create? a metaverse that's foundational philosophy is that it is safe, inclusive, um, and is, uh, uh, and, and uses science to try to move people up a trust pyramid and actually create connections. Um, and we had, you know, a reasonable amount of success with it. We had a couple of really strong, um, uh, we had a a good uh, base of, of real super users that really loved it. And we discovered some interesting things. Um, but ultimately it shut down because it just didn't make enough money. Um, and I think, you know, it's, that's a good little mini case study. Um, you know, you can have the best of intentions with the metaverse. You can say, this is going to be friendship first, um, and you can design for it. Um, but ultimately people need to have the innate desire for the thing for it to really like connect. So I think maybe part of why tech is falling apart so much right now, um, and just to, uh, pat anybody on the back who might need it, it'll come back. It'll stabilize probably in like the next two years. Um, but part of the reason it's falling apart is because I think we are questioning it. So the innate human desire is not for a 3D virtual space right now. We're not like, yeah, I just, I, oh, it would be so much better if only I had another virtual platform to hang out on. Yeah. Um, you know, oof, I just, I needed a 13th new chat message that I need to check on my phone. Um, we don't want that right now. What, what we want as a species, at least for my perspective is um is that real life connection um and in a and i think a disconnect from tech i think we're all a little bit tired of tech there is definitely some tech fatigue going on (laughs) on everything Uh, there is like a trending thing and it's probably one of my last questions i just want you to know your thoughts about it you know i've been kind of um uh kind of bitterly ranting about this like idea that game developers i mean the game industry is booming right on all fronts we're making more money than ever there's more products and uh accessibility right Mm -hmm. there's more gamers than ever right i mean there's fortnite popularize you know us right but as game developers i feel like we're still like the bastard child in the back (laughs) seat on these innovation, you know, the <laughs> Oculus like killed it, right? They got bought by yeah. Facebook, but yeah. you no, know, they're suffering right now because they took the tech and told the nerd to sit in the back. And a lot of businessmen are making decisions <laughs> on, on, like you were saying before, like a lot of educators yeah. are not finding success gamifying, right? Because they're not game desi- designers first, right? Yeah. They're educators yeah. and trying to use game design principles <laughs> uh, to, to apply to their lesson and it's not working or at least kind of working but not to full extent in the same way tech you know they're taking the tools that we develop yeah on all these entertainment movies are using these crazy green screen virtual stages right using our tech right right? but again it's like hey nerd go back there while we take it over we got it from here right there's definitely a a, uh elitist attitude right when it comes to using our things and so the metaverse like you said yo we created this many times right successfully you know ever heard of wow you know but like again there's this stalemate of progress right yeah. when it was hot it was like i still love the idea of ready player one that encompasses yeah. everything right I, cool. I love the best parts of ready player one yeah I, I love the best part you know not the yeah. corporate ads and all this stuff yeah. but like the idea that you can jump in with friends and hang out and play all these different games i still think epic right. is the leading and probably maybe roblox whoever like yep. kind of like hidden <laughs> hidden winners going coming up but like there's definitely the conversation evolves around these tech leaders who are not game designers who are making headlines 
Yeah. And, you know, the biggest thing that's coming out from Apple this year is like, oh, they're coming out with an AR thing. It's going to change everything. <laughs> it's like, isn't that our shit? It's like, yeah. it's, <laughs> so I want to hear your thoughts. It's like this constant feeling. It is a feeling. Yeah. I can't confirm. I don't have stats. But there's a feeling <laughs> that game developers are constantly put in the backseat of their innovations. And yeah. it. I haven't seen take away, run away success, right? Where yeah. someone have taken our thing and just killed it, right? I yep. think the closest thing is these virtual stages, but you know, at in truth, like the really innovative one, they're, they're game developers actually running the shows, right? They're, yeah. and they're not like, you know, visual effects artists suddenly learning Unreal and they're like, oh, they're kick-ass. More kick-ass yeah. than Tony, your vet from Unreal 2 on, right? Yeah. So I know it's a loaded Dude. question, but I want to yeah. hear your thoughts about this. <laughs> This is unfair. You you hit me with the question. We could spend the entire like, yeah, yeah. episode talking about it at the very end. Um, man, shit. I don't know. <laughs> um, I 100% get what you're feeling and, and feel it too. And it's actually a pretty interesting point. It's one I, one I haven't talked about too much. Um, you know, we are... Uh, we're one of the, so first of all, um, every form of new media gets shit on by the previous forms of media. So like when the radio came out, there's all kinds of newspaper articles about how radio waves give you cancer and stuff like that. Um, and when movies, you know, when, when, when the silver screen or like gold screen, whatever, when movies started happening, same deal. Um, when CDs came out, same deal. Um, and it's just it, it's a it's a I think, honestly, I know I'm being kind of anti-capitalistic, but it's a byproduct of capitalism, I think, mm-hmm. uh, you know, corporations have a um, have a vested interest in protecting themselves from innovators who take their market share. Right. right, right. So uh, and so it makes sense for the, for them to, to shit on the radio because it makes it so that the radio takes longer to be adopt, be adop, be adopted. So then the newspaper can like figure out a tactic to deal with this new form of media that they can't handle. So all of that, I think, um, is part of what weighs against game design and game development. And that's part of why game developers are still not like rock stars, yeah. which they should be. Um, you know, they fundamentally change us on a daily basis. There's, I, I, work so hard and and try to do the best things possible and and heal people and make the the world better and i do that because video games propagandized me too (laughs) but like like in a way that i consented to that i loved um and i and i think essentially we're just still despite the fact that we are getting a little bit older now we're still the new kids on the block and so there's just simply less respect for it um as far as us innovating things that, that people keep stealing and then taking away from the game developers, mm-hmm. I love that perspective. I hadn't thought about that. Um, I, I don't, <laughs> I can see exactly what you're talking about. I think, I think the thing is like, um, you know, games are a product that people don't have to do like yeah. we were talking about earlier. Um, but because of that, we've actually become really effective designers. Yeah. Um, you know, we've figured out we, we can't lean on, oh boy, do you feel fat? Like take this this pill, it'll get rid of your fat. Um, we we simply can't. You know, nobody is like, you're gonna be so much cooler mm-hmm. if you play this video game. Like we can't really lean on the traditional product design levers. So we instead have to lean entirely on creating something that's compelling just because it's interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, just because I want to pick it up and play with it. Um, and I think I think essentially, you know, you said I fully expect designers to be the ones designing the future. I think that's true too. And I'm a game designer, so I'm biased, but like we essentially are the ones who, who have figured out and on a daily basis practice creating things that are compelling for their own sake and their own sake only. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know how we stop business people from stealing our ideas and then ruining them. Uh, I think maybe that's just part of the natural ecosystem. Yeah. Um, and uh, otherwise, all we can really do is keep building awesome stuff and, and do our best to support the right people uh, instead of supporting those big wigs. Yeah. Uh, the, just to kind of tag on to that, you know, the, you hear this over and over again with Silicon Valley uh, engineers, right? They're first stake into engineering and, and making code was through games. They wanted to code a game 
for their friends and themselves. And that that's yeah. how they got into it. And like you talked and listened to the biggest influencers that changed, you know, tech industry, that, that their roots are from games. It's just, you know, it's a fun way to get into things. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it'll change if it, when you know if we're gonna get more credited. I mean, I'm seeing like even movies are getting better from Game Source. Yeah, you know, Last of Us is killing it, right? Super yeah. Mario <laughs> Brothers is amazing, but yeah. like there still doesn't. I mean, there are certain conversations where like I play this, you know, so every saying that, and they're not c- completely shamed, right? Yeah. But there dis- definitely is like a distinction and disengagement with you know. It's not popularized to say I play games, you know, or right. make games for a living. It's kind of still looked yeah. down upon. Maybe made, they got to age out. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> right? It's made tremendous progress. Like, yes. you know, when I liked games when I was a kid, I was a I was an outcast. Now yeah. that I like games, I'm normal. Um, yeah, you're, and that's you're, progress. <laughs> you're you're uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, you're you're. Uh, not respected but like more you're you're tolerated we're tolerated yeah, yeah, at this yeah, point yeah. yeah hey that's good actually like that. <laughs> that, that, that's, that's progress of, we're like yeah on the progression of gamers we're not we're not rock stars yet but at least we're tolerated <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> well, William, I mean, I hopefully that was a painless hour, but we are at the hour mark. It was a great awesome. conversation. This yeah. is the part of the time where I actually shut up, hand over the mic for you to talk to the good people out there, how to find you, uh, yeah. give attention to anything that you want to talk to them about. Go for sure. For awesome, man. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's been a pleasure to be here. Hopefully you enjoyed uh, listening to all this. So like I said, my name is Willem Delventhal. I'm a game designer and a business founder. Um, my students affectionately call me the wizard of joy. Uh, I, I talk about Gandalf as my idol, and I think that's why. Um, and I uh, f- focus a lot on uh, gamification, trying to bring sort of the magic that we've discovered in games to other systems um, in the business world, in, in many different aspects of life. Um, and I really want to see uh, a bit of a renaissance in games. I want to see more people building games. And I want to see that in general too. You know, I, if you have a passion for, I don't know, twirling pens, I want, <laughs> I want you to be able to make a career in twirling pens. Um, so I really try to be, like I said, tactically optimistic as much as I can. Uh, if you want some of that tactical optimism, hear about game design, other stuff like that, the best place to follow me is actually LinkedIn. Um, you can find me just by searching my name, Willem Delventhal, W-I-L-L-E-M-D-E-L. L-V-E-N-T-H-A-L. Um, follow me there. Um, and I'm around on a couple other social platforms, but I'm much less engaged there. Uh, my company is called the Indie Game Academy. We are a gamified online school for game developers. We actually tend to work with adult learners. A lot of people are switching careers. So our average age is probably like 26. Um, and uh, yeah, we just make the most fun game development boot camps in the world, like hands down. I can't prove that with numbers, but like just come and join one and you'll find out. <laughs> um, you can find that at IndieGameAcademy.com. And yeah, that's, that's about it. Great, man. Thanks again for coming on. I always love talking to game developers, a fellow podcaster. It's just an easier yeah. conversation. <laughs> I just can sit back. I know I talk too much on this one, but uh, if anything, oh, that's, I couldn't restrain my excitement. You know, there's so many uh, rants <laughs> that I've been kind of <laughs> holding in uh, <laughs> that I just wanted to kind of feel your thoughts out there. Uh, yeah. But thank you for coming on, man. As always, all the links that uh, to find William oh, yeah. will be uh, provided. Uh, yeah, check but- out the Indie Game Lunch Hour. I forgot about that one. There you <laughs> That's go. Our podcast. Yeah. But uh, yeah, man, thanks for keeping in touch. I'll uh, be talking to you and everyone else soon. Okay. See you guys next awesome. week.